Thank you very much for that introduction. Actually, I, I want the record to show that when I'm in pubs, I don't use my middle initial. <laughs> I usually don't even use my real name. In fact, if it's a particularly rowdy pub where the authorities are likely to be summoned, the name I often use is Bill Frailing. So. <laughs> I want to thank Lucas for putting this together. I think this is maybe the time to say that, for putting together this, uh, this symposium. Uh, it's been great so far, and I've just enjoyed every minute of it. And I want to thank all of you out there, because I understand it's a beautiful day outside, and yet here we are appreciating the life and contributions of Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to talk, as has been advertised, about Lincoln as a naval war leader. Uh, I think following Bill's comments is appropriate here because, like him, I agree that we need to appreciate that Lincoln shows us as president a trajectory, not a plateau. It's not simply a case of taking a person of genius and applying that genius to a set of problems. We must be careful using that phrase. Do we mean that Lincoln was somehow gifted with the intellectual and psychological tools that made him great, and that as a result his rise to greatness, even to immortality, was simply the application of that native genius to whatever problem was at hand. And if we do that, I think we do him an injustice. For Lincoln's greatness was not a gift at birth, but the product of a lifetime of effort, of careful and thoughtful reading, of considering and reconsidering, of, of arguing, often with himself, both orally and on paper, of making mistakes and learning from them. He developed the rare strength of character necessary to suppress his own ego to higher causes. And this process of learning and arguing and adjusting continued throughout his life and throughout his presidency. He was more of a political genius in 1865 than he was in 1861 when it must be said he made a number of rookie mistakes as president. But he seldom made them twice, and when he did, he acknowledged them publicly and changed course. It was, in short, as Bill has suggested, Lincoln's growth that made him our greatest president. That's what allowed Lincoln to tackle issues that were completely foreign to him and after some trial and error to emerge as a genius in those fields too. Certainly he devoted little time to questions of strategy or tactics in the decades before he became president. As a Western country lawyer, he was hardly expert in matters of the sea. I know but little about ships, he confessed to Gideon Wells in 1861, but he had learned a lot about people. And just as important, he was willing to learn more. My point here is that Lincoln's genius was a process more than it was a character trait. And today I'm going to take a look at the role that Lincoln played, particularly in the Western campaigns of the American Civil War, in the first four months of 1862, crucial months in Lincoln's emergence as a war leader, and outline the circumstances that led him to step into what was virtually a void or a vacuum of leadership and become a far more activist commander-in-chief and war leader than he had ever imagined, certainly prior to 1861. And yet in the end, I do think it was Lincoln's strategic vision that emerged triumphant, though his role in that triumph is seldom acknowledged. Lincoln began to think about Union grand strategy from almost the first day of the war. On April 25th of 1861, the day that the 7th New York Regiment marched into Washington, D.C. to ease fears of residents that the rebel army across the river was about to seize the capital in a coup de main, Lincoln was musing aloud to John Hay, who witnessed this soliloquy and included it in his writings, about how the administration could regain control of the crisis. I intend at, at present, he told Hay, to fill Fortress Monroe with men and stores, blockade the ports effectually, 
provide for the entire safety of the capital, keep them quietly employed this way, and then go down to Charleston and pay her the little debt we are owing her. Now, there is in this statement just the shadow of the famous anaconda plan that would emerge some weeks and months later. What is missing, of course, is any reference to a Western River campaign, a curious omission in some ways since Lincoln was both a Westerner and to a certain extent a river man. At the time, Lincoln was still thinking of the conflict as a kind of police action to pacify an out-of-control minority. Lincoln never really quite let go, at least not until perhaps 1864, of the notion that there was in the South a large body of secret unionists who simply needed the opportunity to express their views. By the end of 1861, with the capital secure and the blockade established, Lincoln had developed a more sophisticated and detailed concept of strategy, and one that did include a western and river campaign. He began his analysis with the simple fact that, and I'm mixing some of Lincoln's words here in with my own, so with the simple fact that the Union states had the greater numbers over the rebellious states, operating with, while the uh, rebel states had the advantage of operating with interior lines of communication. They could get from one point to another more swiftly. In Lincoln's words, the greater facility of concentrating forces upon points of collision. Not the way the tactical manuals put it, but close enough. It seemed evident to Lincoln that the way to take advantage of these circumstances was to menace the enemy at several different points at the same time. This would force the rebels to do one of two things. Either they would have to concentrate their forces in one place by temporarily abandoning the others, or they would have to split their forces into a large number of smaller units and try to defend everywhere. If the enemy chose concentration, Lincoln thought the Union forces should forbear to attack the strengthened position and move in to occupy the abandoned sites. If instead the enemy divided his forces into smaller units, they could be defeated in detail one by one. It was, in fact, a clear-headed and straightforward analysis, but its success depended entirely on coordination of Union forces, and that depended on effective cooperation by the generals in the field, and as Lincoln was already learning in the spring of 1862, achieving such cooperation was problematical at best. Lincoln was not eager to manage that coordination himself. Unlike his Confederate counterpart, he never cherished visions of donning a uniform and riding to the front, and I invite you to pause just a moment to visualize that. <laughs> or even moving strategic pieces about on a chessboard. His first hope had been that Winfield Scott would assume that role. But it had become clear that despite Scott's brilliant success in earlier wars, the current task was beyond him. It was precisely to achieve the kind of coordination that Lincoln believed to be essential to Union success that he turned to George McClellan endowing him with command not just of the Army of the Potomac, but of all Union armies. By January of 1862, McClellan had brought a sense of purpose and direction to the mobilization of that army, but had not yet demonstrated any eagerness to test it in battle. And his oversight of the nation's other armies was largely pro forma. Worse, that same January of 1862, McClellan fell ill with typhoid fever, leaving a void at the top of the command pyramid. With the Secretary of War, Lincoln's first Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, already a lame duck and on his way out, and McClellan in his sickbed, there was no direction or purpose or guidance at the top of the command pyramid. A delegation from eastern Tennessee filled Lincoln's ears with tales of Union patriots who were being hanged and driven to despair and a joint congressional committee met with Lincoln to complain about the absence of a vigorous prosecution of the war. When Lincoln wrote to Major General Henry Wager Halleck to ask how soon he might be able to move southward from St. Louis, Halleck replied with a lengthy lecture on the principles of war. At the bottom of this unhelpful dissertation, Lincoln wrote, 
it is exceedingly discouraging. This was the same day that he dropped in on Montgomery Meigs, the Army's quartermaster general, to whom he unburdened himself. The people are impatient, the president groaned. The general of the Army has typhoid fever. The bottom is out of the tub. What shall I do? It was under these circumstances that Lincoln's attorney general, Edward Bates, began to urge him to take the strategic reins into his own hands. Bates even wondered why McClellan had been granted the title of General-in-Chief when the nation already had a constitutional commander-in-chief. Whether Bates touched a nerve with that or the circumstances simply compelled it, Lincoln saw that someone clearly had to provide direction and leadership, and since there was no one else in a position to do it, he took it upon himself. He scheduled a meeting of what amounted to a council of war on January 10th, inviting Seward, Chase, and Thomas A. Scott, who sat in for the lame duck Simon Cameron, plus two of the Army's senior generals, Irvin McDowell, the unlucky commander of the battlefield at first Bull Run, who was the candidate of the congressional committee that had visited him, and William B. Franklin, the senior division commander in McClellan's army and an acolyte of Little Mac. Lincoln met three times with this ad hoc war council, and inevitably word of it leaked to McClellan, probably through Franklin. And when the group reassembled on January 13th, there was McClellan, in uniform, looking haggard and tired, but by golly, he was out of bed and present. His presence silenced everyone else in the room. Even Lincoln waited for his general-in-chief to assume control of the meeting, but McClellan sat silent and sullen. When Lincoln asked him what should be done, his reply was, the case is so clear a blind man could see it. When Chase asked him if he could be a little more specific, (laughs) he refused to divulge his plans on the grounds that no one in this room can keep a secret. When at length Lincoln asked him directly if he had a plan of action for the Army of the Potomac, McClellan said that he did. Then General... Lincoln announced, I shall not order you to give it. And with that, he adjourned the meeting. As long as the commanding general was willing and able to do his job, Lincoln would not wrest it from him. Yet. Of course, even if McClellan was successful in Virginia, it would still not achieve what Lincoln saw as the essential key to Union success, the coordination of all Union armies east and west in a simultaneous movement. If and when McClellan advanced, the two Western armies would have to synchronize their activities as well to prevent the Confederates from concentrating on one or another of the Union offensives. Moreover, both Western armies would be heavily dependent on the river system for transportation and particularly for supply. In the West, railroads were useful to be sure, but railroads could be wrecked. Railroad bridges could be burned, and in any case, railroads did not have the capacity of river transport. Whatever happened in the Western theater would depend not only on the coordination of the field armies, but on cooperation between those armies and river gunboats. And this led to a great deal of confusion and uncertainty about just who had or should have authority on the Western rivers. Now, according to tradition, the authority of the Navy stopped at the high tide mark. The Navy had jurisdiction over warships operating on the Potomac, the James, the York, and other tidal rivers of the eastern seaboard. But the western rivers, the brown water rivers, they were the Army's problem. Alas, constructing and commanding gunboats required specialized knowledge that few Army officers had and fewer were interested in obtaining. Lincoln's Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, agreed to send a naval officer to Cincinnati to help the Army prepare a rivering force for the Western Campaign. But this led to confusion, too. For while Navy officers in the West were administratively under the Navy Department, they took their orders from the War Department. And there was no protocol in existence to determine which department bore the responsibilities for pay, supplies, and other such issues. According to the Constitution of the United States, there was only one person in the entire country who had simultaneous command authority over both the Army 
and the Navy. I was once explaining this to my students at the Naval Academy and said, you know, in the, during the early years of the Civil War, even Winfield Scott himself, Brevet Lieutenant General, three-star Winfield Scott, could not give an order to the lowest-ranking seaman recruit on a ship at sea. And my students said, well, sir, that's right. <laughs> that's how it ought to be. But as a result of these circumstances, it was the tall, ungainly, and currently despondent man who occupied the White House who would have to assume that burden. And in his effort to effect a coordinated campaign in the West, Lincoln would find that he not only had to synchronize the movements of his generals hard enough, he also had to coordinate the Army and the Navy, a task roughly equivalent to mixing oil and water. Well, the man that Wells sent out to Cincinnati was John Rogers. And like most naval officers of his era, or any era for that matter, Rogers' professional goal his entire life had been command at sea, and he looked upon his assignment to Cincinnati as a kind of banishment, especially since Wells made it clear that he was to do so, in Wells' words, under the direction and regulation of the Army. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Nevertheless, Rogers got to work at once finding three suitable vessels, which he purchased and then began to convert to military use by strengthening their decks so they could bear the weight of the heavy naval guns, replacing their thin bulwarks with five inches of oak planking, dropping the boilers into the lower hold and rerouting the steam pipes. And those first three river boats, the Tyler, the Lexington, and the Conestoga, were destined to play pretty crucial roles in the Western Campaign, especially at Shiloh, for those of you who are students of the Western Campaign. But when Wells found out about this, he was furious. He fired off a telegram informing Rogers that he had overstepped his authority. The movements on the Mississippi are under the direction and control of the Army, Wells lectured him. Therefore, all purchases of boats must be made by the War Department. I think Wells' concern here was primarily financial. He wanted to make sure the Navy Department didn't get stuck with the bill for these three ships. The gunboats are not wanted for naval purposes, he asserted. This is still Wells. If they are required for the Army, the Army must make requisition on the War Department. And then, as if to demonstrate just how far Wells was from Lincoln's vision of a coordinated offensive, Wells informed Rogers that the two branches of service must not become complicated and embarrassed by any attempt at a combined movement on the rivers of the interior. Rogers might have survived Wells' peak if he had managed to get along with the Army commander in the West, but that was John C. Fremont. And Fremont became annoyed with him, too. Naval constructor Samuel Pook was fabricating a half dozen armored gunboats for the River War under Army contract, and Rogers' efforts to ensure Navy participation in the planning and construction led Fremont to decide the Navy officer was meddling in Army business. He complained about it to Wells, and largely to gratify Fremont, Wells decided to replace Rogers with newly promoted Navy Captain Andrew Hull Foote. As he had with Rogers, Wells made it clear to Foote he was under the direction of the War Department, and that any requisitions for his flotilla must go through the Army. By now, uh, this is uh, February 62, the, the weakness, not to say the folly, of having Navy officers draw on the War Department for logistic support was beginning to become evident. Wells expected that the men of the gunboat flotilla would be paid by the Army. But Fremont said, those guys are on boats. They're not in the Army. I'm not going to pay those guys. And the result was they didn't get paid at all. Nor did Foote have a secure source of supplies. He told Wells he was embarrassed about powder and shot, having been positively refused these by both the Army and the Navy. You can have the gunboat, but you can't have any gunpowder, and you can't have any shells. So he wrote to Cameron, uh, this is Foote now, but the lame duck Secretary of War had more pressing problems than meeting the needs of some Navy officer in Ohio, for crying out loud. And the fact was that as important as it seemed to the Western campaign and indeed to Lincoln's entire strategic vision, no one accepted responsibility for Foote's orphan command. As Edward Bates put it in his diary, the boats are under the War Department, and yet are commanded by naval officers. Of course they are neglected. No one knows anything about them. 
These were the circumstances that compelled Lincoln to step in to this vacuum of authority. And the specific issue that did it was a curious kind of craft known as a bomb vessel or a mortar raft. They were essentially flat bottom rafts about 40 to 50 feet long, each of which carried a 13-inch mortar amidships designed to fire 13-inch shells three miles downrange on a high trajectory that could go around the bends and rivers or over mountains and forests. Very useful. Uh, Both service recognized their potential value, but neither service was willing to accept administrative or, more importantly, financial responsibility. So Lincoln ordered Gustavus Vassa Fox, the assistant secretary of the Navy for whom Lincoln had created that post, to find out what was going on. And Fox sent a telegram out to Foote to tell him, the president desires immediately a full report and full particulars relative to the mortar boats, the number in commission, the number of mortars mounted, the number of mortars ready to be mounted, the time of completion of all boats, etc. And as if to punctuate it, added, acknowledge this. Well, Foote replied that there were only four mortars that had been completed at Pittsburgh and that all four of those were being sent to David Dixon Porter's squadron in the Gulf for the attempt at New Orleans. No mortars or mortar rafts had been prepared for the upper Mississippi. And since no one else would assume responsibility, Lincoln decided to take over the project personally. He told Navy Lieutenant Henry A. Wise of the Ordnance Bureau, Now I am going to devote a part of every day to these mortars, and I won't leave off until it fairly rains bombs. He directed Wise to tell Foote to get the mortars ready at the earliest possible moment, asking him at the same time, What can I do here to advance this? What is lacking? He ordered Foote to send him daily reports on the preparation of the mortar boats. Telegraph us every day, he ordered, showing the progress or lack of progress in this matter. By stepping into this vacuum of authority in the Western theater, Lincoln became not only the commander-in-chief, but effectively his own chief of staff, using Lieutenant Wise as his aide. At Lincoln's direction, Wise, whose office was in the Washington Navy Yard, about a 20-minute carriage right away, uh, Wise carried Foote's telegrams, those daily telegrams, to the White House the moment they arrived. The president looked them over, made a decision, dictated a response back to Wise, who then went back to the Navy Yard and telegraphically sent Lincoln's response out west. And Foote sensed a new urgency at once. The president, he wired Pittsburgh, is in a hurry for mortar boats. And if the president wanted mortar boats, he would, by golly, have them. Over the next few weeks, there was a flurry of telegraphic message back and forth between Cairo, Illinois, and Washington, D.C., as Lincoln managed the mobilization of Western mortar boats from the White House. Lincoln resolved even minor logistical questions. Foote was concerned about the problem of onboard accommodation for the crews. After all, the mortar boats were simply flat bottom rafts with no accommodation for the sailors. The men must have a steamer for their accommodation, foot wired. Shall I purchase or hire a steamer for them? Wise checked with Lincoln and reported back. The president directs me to say that he approves and desires you to go ahead. When Foote sought ammunition for the new craft, Lincoln directed the Army's ordnance chief to supply whatever ammunition may be required. Lincoln told Wise he wanted Foote to have enough shells to rain the rebels out with a refreshing shower of sulfur and brimstone. (laughs) When the Army balked at paying the salaries of soldiers who transferred into the gunboat service, Lincoln ordered the War Department to pay up. Wise reported to Foote, I know he didn't like the term, forgive me for this, Uncle Abe, as you already know, has gone into this business with a will, and the wires have not ceased vibrating, nor will they, until the thing is done. By involving himself directly in the construction, preparation, and fitting out of the mortar boat flotilla, and by encouraging Foote to complete work on the gunboats, Lincoln demonstrated how to cut through the traditional institutional barriers between the two services. As Wise put it, he is an evidently practical man understands precisely what he wants, and is not turned aside by anyone when he has his work before him. 
Bates and Fox both suggested to Lincoln that might it not be easier simply to transfer the riverine flotilla over to the Navy Department, and that eventually was done. But Lincoln did not direct it. Instead, he showed by example how it was possible to overcome barriers between the services. This initial exercise of authority led to more. Soon the victories at Forts Henry and Donelson had not only smashed the rebel defensive line in the west, they proved the value of armored gunboats on the western rivers and the importance of cooperation between the services. The Mississippi was next, and Halleck was eager to employ the proven stratagem of combined operations against Columbus, Kentucky, the so-called Gibraltar of the west. Well, Foote was willing enough to give it a go, but he had to repair his ships after the early activities, which meant bringing them back to Cairo. Halleck wanted to keep them on the river. Foote complained to Wise that the generals were detaining two boats up the river, which I want to repair. Wise took the complaint to Lincoln, who resolved the dispute in Foote's favor, directing Halleck to send the boats to Cairo for repairs. For all his initial reluctance, Lincoln was not only adjudicating conflicts between the services, he was directing the movement of particular ships. By the end of March, Lincoln was beginning to hope that his vision of a simultaneous advance by Union forces might soon be realized. Even McClellan's Army of the Potomac was on the move, lurching into motion in a transfer of the largest military sea lift ever attempted, taking the Army of the Potomac from the banks of its namesake river to Fort Monroe at the tip of the Virginia Peninsula. A thousand miles to the west, Grant's smaller army also used transports escorted by the gunboats Lexington and Tyler that Commander Rogers had purchased to ascend the Tennessee River to Pittsburgh Landing, just above the Mississippi state line near a little country church called Shiloh. <coughs> Meanwhile, on the Mississippi, Foote partnered with Major General John Pope for a push down the Big Muddy itself. And a fourth squadron gathered off the mouth of the Mississippi under Farragut and Porter to threaten New Orleans. Now McClellan's movements in Virginia had no direct bearing on these three uh, offensives in the east. But if Grant and Foote and Farragut all moved more or less simultaneously, it would at last fulfill Lincoln's strategic vision of a coordinated offensive and challenge the ability of the Confederacy to defend itself from three offensives at the same time. When Lincoln explained the idea to Bates on March 15th, Bates saw it clearly and recorded it in his diary. The enemy is really in a strait, Bates writes. If he moves his iron boats upstream to meet foot, then he leaves the lower river open to Farragut and Porter. And if he sends them down to meet the Gulf Force, the coast is clear for foot. Lincoln kept track of the uh, campaign via the telegraph. To be sure, much of the president's attention was focused on McClellan and the uh, Virginia Peninsula, but he also kept up with Foote's operations on the Mississippi. The contrast, by the way, in these two reports coming to him could not have been greater. McClellan's messages complained of bad weather, bad roads, poor transportation, and always, always a need for more troops. The news from the West was much more upbeat. Every day, Wise brought him the latest information sent downriver from Island Number 10 to Cairo by a riverboat and then forwarded to Washington by telegraph. Lincoln had told Wise to bring him the latest news regardless of the time of day. And taking him at his word, Wise showed up at 2 o'clock in the morning on March 17th to report that Foote's flotilla was in line of battle and within two miles of the enemy. Lincoln may have been especially interested to learn that the mortar boats had fired their first shots in anger that day, lobbing a few shells to try the range. The next day came news that the firing had begun in earnest, and soon Foote was reporting that the rebel fortifications were being battered all to pieces, though he also noted that a gun had burst on board the St. Louis and scalded four sailors. Probably for Lincoln's benefit, he added, the mortars are doing great work. But after raising expectations of a quick victory, within a few days, Foote reported this place, island number 10, is harder to conquer than Columbus. Indeed, it did not think it could be taken at all without a land assault from the, from the rear, cooperation. For more than two weeks, Foote's 
mortar rafts rained down sulfur and brimstone, in Lincoln's phrase, on the rebel defenses. Then all of a sudden there was an avalanche of news. On April 6th, Foote reported that one of his ironclads, Henry Walk's Carondelet, had run past the batteries at Island No. 10 without injury and arrived safely at New Madrid, Missouri. Another vessel made the trip the next night, and together those two gunboats successfully escorted Pope's army across the river to the rear of Island No. 10, and the cabinet was in session on April 8th when news arrived that the enemy fortifications at Island No. 10 had surrendered unconditionally. At almost the same moment, another telegram brought news of the most terrible battle of the war. The telegraph operator at Cincinnati reported that a rebel army had attacked Grant's force at Pittsburgh Landing in overwhelming force. Not until the next day did Lincoln learn that after a two-day fight, the rebel attackers had been driven back and that the Battle of Shiloh was a Union victory. Suddenly, all things seemed possible. The despondency of January gave way to near euphoria in April. Though McClellan was still stalled in the Virginia Peninsula, battling mud and his own fears, Union forces in the West had seized all three Confederate defensive strong points, and their main field army had been captured. Surely Foote's gunboats would now speed southward to take Memphis and then on to New Orleans. With luck, they would meet Farragut's squadron coming upriver from the Crescent City. It took a little longer than expected for Farragut to get his big ocean-going warships over the sandbars at the mouth of the Mississippi. Not until April 15th did he manage to assemble his flotilla of 17 seagoing warships plus Porter's 20 mortar rafts at the head of passes below the forts. Throughout the rest of the month, he kept track of McClellan's lack of progress on the peninsula, but Lincoln also waited for news from Farragut. It came on April 29th. Five days earlier, on the 24th, Farragut had run past the river fort south of New Orleans, and then Farragut had steamed upriver to the city. There was no resistance. Significantly, the reason that the Confederate authorities were unable to resist Farragut at New Orleans was that they had decided to concentrate, one of their only two options, against Grant at Pittsburgh Landing, and the few units that were left at New Orleans evacuated the city when Farragut's dark ships anchored off the levee. Though the civil population shouted epithets and shook their fists, it was all sound and fury. Farragut sent a Navy captain ashore to raise the American flag over the Custom House, and New Orleans, the largest city in the South, fell to the Union. As Lincoln had foreseen, simultaneous attacks at different places had forced the rebels to choose what to defend hoping that their forts would contain the threat from the river, they had concentrated their western armies for an all-out attack on Grant at Shiloh. And though they had come close, the gamble had failed. That decision had stripped both Memphis and New Orleans of troops and left them ripe for conquest. What this admittedly very short history of the war in the West in the first four months of 1862 suggests about Lincoln's emergence as an effective commander-in-chief is that he found himself compelled more by circumstance than predilection to become an activist war leader. He had begun by proposing a strategic vision to his field commanders, but when they responded with objections and explanations, he began to embrace a more active role. His involvement with the production and delivery of mortar boats, both for Foote's squadron on the Mississippi and porters at New Orleans, was a symptom of his new willingness to involve himself personally in the management of military affairs. In the end, as it happened, the mortar boats did not prove decisive, but the strategic vision he had articulated in January had been validated. For the Confederacy proved incapable of defending both the upper and lower reaches of the Mississippi at the same time. Grant survived their furious assault at Pittsburgh Landing, and both Memphis and New Orleans fell to the Union. Tennessee and Louisiana were reclaimed. At both the northern and southern ends of the river, Union forces had established a grip they would never relinquish. Indeed, the Confederacy never fully recovered from the reverses of those first four months of 1862. And some, at least, of the credit for that belonged to the Union president, who had begun to act the role of commander-in-chief in fact, as well as in name. 
Thank you. Thank you, and here we go. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, obviously, uh, President Lincoln, you know, he was interested in, in, in the naval commanders and who, the, who he would promote and who he thought could get the job done. Um, could you tell us a little bit about his relationship with uh, David Dixon Porter and uh, even a little about the, uh, at the end of the war when Nixon, uh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> when Lincoln urges some action from uh, Admiral Porter about, it's around, I guess, April 2nd. And they're, they're on board the uh, Malvern. Yeah, it, it is interesting. This is very, you mean in 65, yeah. at the very oh, yeah, end of the 65, war. Yeah, 65, right. Lincoln's relationship with all of his admirals was, was uh, idiosyncratic to the extent that it was different for each individual, obviously, based yeah. on the personality. The one with David Dixon Porter is interesting to me. Uh, Porter emerged fairly early uh, as one of the leaders in the Western theater. Uh, Porter, of course, commanded the mortarboat squadron at New Orleans. He subsequently became commander of the Mississippi squadron itself. He was elevated from commander past Captain to Rear Admiral in a single step in order to take that job. And, and then, of course, there was the Red River campaign and the campaign. So by the end of the war, he was the fair-haired boy. He and David Farragut were presumed to be the great naval leaders of the war. But Lincoln, I believe, had his number from the beginning. Uh, there's a great little moment that Gideon Wells talks about in his wonderful diary where um, they're both at the War Department Telegraph Office waiting for information to come in from a campaign. I've forgotten which one now. But, but Lincoln was, as Lincoln could do, uh, and would do only quietly in small groups, uh, despairing of some of his field commanders in the Army and said, what is it about the training of Army officers versus Navy officers that I don't have these problems with Navy officers? This is another story I tell in Annapolis, by the way. <laughs> um, and Wells responded by saying, well, I think the Navy was just lucky in finding its two great admirals early in Farragut and Porter. And there was a short silence. And Lincoln <laughs> responded by saying, there has not been a better appointment in either branch of service in the whole war than Farragut. But Porter is a busy schemer, untrustworthy, and looks out too much for himself, which I think is pretty darn accurate. He did not let that stand in the way of elevating Porter to important positions because Porter could get the job done, but he knew his man. There's another famous line. This one doesn't come from Lincoln. It's two other officers talking to one another. And one said, well, what did you hear about this? Well, I heard about this from, from Porter, which, of course, means it's not true. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. Yes, sir. And yet many at the time felt that his affinity for John Dahlgren was blown up way out of proportion to the man's capabilities. How would you, uh, how would you address that? John Adolphus Dahlgren was the admiral that Lincoln personally liked the most. I mean, he had great trust and confidence in uh, Farragut and was grateful to Farragut uh, for his accomplishments and for not being politically involved and so forth. But he liked Dahlgren. And there were a number of things that drew them together. They were exactly the same age. Interesting enough, because if you look at their uh, contemporary photographs, Lincoln could be his father in terms of, uh, of how the war weathered each of them. Uh, but they were both gadget people. You know, Dahlgren was an ordnance specialist, a Dahlgren gun and the Dahlgren howitzer and so forth. And Lincoln would go down to the Navy Yard regularly, I think in large part to get away from the White House, almost as much as for any other reason. But there he would get together with Dahlgren and they would shoot some cannon and, you know, do guy stuff. Um, and, and Lincoln really, really appreciated that. And during one of these, uh, Dahlgren made it clear that his great ambition was to become an admiral. Well, admiral was a rank only established in 1862. The United States never had an admiral before the Civil War. And now, all of a sudden, the opportunity was there, and all senior captains wanted to be admiral, including Dahlgren. But the legislation that authorized it said you could only become an admiral if you achieved some great heroic accomplishment at sea. Well, the director of the Bureau of Ordnance, who was essentially building the arsenal for the Navy, would never be at sea. So he had, you know, can't you make this happen? Can't you give me a squadron? And Lincoln inquired of Wells. And Wells said, no, no, we really can't do that because, and so on. And finally, after uh, many months of this, Lincoln just said, make Dahlgren an admiral. That's the only time, really, that Lincoln really interfered in terms of what Gideon Wells thought was necessary for the Navy. He said, no, I want, I want him to be an admiral. And, and he became commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, where he performed 
Heroically in the sense that he worked hard every day, but not heroically in the sense of achieving the great event that would win him accolades from Congress. So, and, and finally, the thing they had in common, although this came later in the war, when Ulrich uh, Dahlgren, uh, John Dahlgren's son, was killed in the raid on Richmond, uh, Lincoln went to see him and they commiserated with one another as fathers who had lost sons. Uh, that was another bond that held them together. So I think it was that Lincoln really liked Dahlgren and appreciated his scientific bent in particular. Thank you. You're welcome. Craig, one of the most gripping accounts in your book uh, is how the Navy anticipated Lincoln's emancipation of slaves uh, through their own liberation, as it were. And for me, actually, it's the most gripping account. Uh, could, you get, could you retell that story for us? I, I think, I'm glad you brought that up because it does reach into some of the questions that we've been discussing generally here about the relationship of Lincoln to the whole issue of emancipation and, and, and black freedom and what that means. And, of course, one of the things we need to appreciate about Lincoln, we were discussing this at the break, is Lincoln is, in addition to great heart, wonderful wordsmith, etc., he's a very good politician. He knows exactly how far he can go and how far is too far in the direction or accomplishment of any particular uh, policy objective, including emancipation and black freedom. And what happened along the South Atlantic coast was that circumstances began to develop a momentum of their own. Once the, the blockade is imposed, the sea islands off the coast of Georgia and South Carolina became a kind of no man's land. They were separated from the mainland and therefore not defensible by the Confederacy who pulled back from those positions. The planters abandoned their lands. Uh, uh, slaves escaped from their plantations, many and came down to the coast, you know, way flagging down ships, asking to be taken aboard. Some were taken aboard as sailors, uh, but others were established in, in colonies on Hilton Head and Beaufort and Sapelo and some of the other islands along the coast uh, where they became kind of self sustaining. And then they thought, well, we have to defend ourselves. So uh, DuPont, who was the squadron commander, began to issue guns to them. Now, this is 1862. And guns are being issued to contrabands in contraband camps along the South Atlantic coast. This is well ahead of policy. But Lincoln observed this with great attention and great interest because he was in part measuring what, was, what society would tolerate. And if they wouldn't tolerate, you know, uniformed soldiers with weapons in their hands in 1862, they tolerated this, well then maybe they would tolerate the next step. So Lincoln, I think, was measuring, engaging and events were happening, and, and he dovetailed with those to promote uh, his policy goals without ever getting too far ahead of them that it, it threatened to, to fracture his fragile, not only nation, but his fragile um, political coalition that kept him in office. So I, I agree with I think that was the one, to me, in researching the book, was one of the most interesting aspects of, of the whole uh, adventure. Yes. Uh, apropos doing guy stuff and shooting cannon. You, you mentioned Henry Wise, the Navy ordnance man, and his association with Lincoln in the period that you're mentioning, uh, Wise being the son-in-law of Edward Everett and someone he, Lincoln took along on that trip to Gettysburg in November 1863, uh, someone never actually in action during the war. Do you have any comments about... Uh, Bureau Chief Henry Wise. Henry Wise is a fascinating character and probably deserves his own uh, uh, detailed study. He is the, the third cousin of the Henry Wise who was the Virginia, Confederate Virginia governor as well as this connection. But the connection that I discovered, I had no idea about this until I got into it, and his papers at uh, both the National Archives, the other National Archives downtown, and the New York Historical Society uh, indicate that he had a secret life. Lieutenant Henry A. Wise of the Navy was also Harry Gringo. Now, Harry Gringo was the pseudonym, the nom de plume, of a, a humorist who wrote stories about uh, uh, out west and adventures at sea. And Lincoln had read these. They were in the same style as Artemis Ward, who was one of Lincoln's favorites. And, and Lincoln knew who Harry Gringo was. So when that, I think, helped you know, cement that connection between the president and his young lieutenant. Um, and uh, Wise was also an artist. He wrote these little sketches that he would bring in. Uh, Lincoln ordered him one time, for example, to make sure they had sufficient ordnance, and, and uh, Wise sketched this, uh, you know, a couple lieutenants running along with a long pole dragging uh, gun shells behind them and so forth. So I think it was a personal relationship as well as a professional one, and I think that's one of the things that fueled Lincoln's, Lincoln's entry into 
uh, his new role as an activist commander in chief. But somebody should take up Henry A. Wise, a.k.a. Harry Gringo, and do a little study on him. He's an interesting guy. Yes, Bill. Craig, that was a wonderful... Who, whose name I use in all the pubs. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why I had trouble getting in. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, that was a wonderful talk. It doesn't surprise me a bit, but it was terrific. <laughs> um, in, in view of this two-pronged strategy of Lincoln's, that is to say, put pressure on two points at once, the ultimate two-pronged strategy seems to me to be the West and the East. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that, I think, that victory in the West that, that softens up the East. In view of that, is it possible that McClellan is more right than historians think in thinking that it was too soon to win an all-out war in the East and tell you'd won in the West? It absolutely is physically painful for me to defend McClellan. Um, <laughs> but, but I will say that I think he, he was uh, an insightful and original strategist. I mean, we don't, because of what he was unable to bring himself to do on the battlefield, we often don't give him sufficient credit for what he was able to do logistically and in terms of strategic organization. Uh, the person who, who gives him perhaps, perhaps too much credit for this kind of insight is Rowena Reed, whose 1978 book, I think, Combined Operations in the Civil War, uh, makes him the hero because he did have a vision that both the East and the West had to move together and the, the idea was to break the lines of communication and simultaneous approach. And those are all wonderful things, but see what it suggests was that the Prussian system of having a staff to, to, to write plans and then somebody like Grant or Patton to execute those plans might have been a better circumstance for George McClellan. But yes, I think the short answer is yes. I think he did have a, a clearer vision than many others give him credit for in terms of the, the crucial uh, role of simultaneous approaches and that therefore uh, hurrying up to capture Richmond was not necessarily the way to go. But M McClellan's weaknesses, I think, overwhelmed his, his insights to his historical discredit, obviously. Thank you. Another thing you cover in your book is um, political admirals versus political generals early in the war. So could you kind of comment on if Lincoln had pressure from politicians to you know, right. put, put specific people in specific command? Right. Political generals, and there were, people can all name a handful of them, Ben Butler and Nathaniel Banks come quickly to mind, and there are many others. Uh, were individuals who had political clout of some kind, former congressmen, current congressmen, mayors, fire chiefs, who knows, whatever, but someone who had a constituency that Lincoln felt he needed to include in his coalition. So they would get positions and then cause Grant or somebody else problems down the road. Now, this, this never happened, never happened in the Navy. And there were no such thing as political admirals in that sense, that someone who said, well, I'm, you know, I'm a congressman. I know how to command a steam-driven warship using celestial navigation and at sea I, and firing rifled guns with heavy ordnance. I can do that. And again, being from the Naval Academy, I have to say, you see, to be a naval officer, you actually have to know something. I'm like... So none of these people came to Lincoln and said, make me a captain, make me an admiral, I'm a natural leader of men, as often happened in the army. You know, if you can lead a community, you can lead a brigade. That was the, the assumption. There were, however, admirals who had political baggage. And uh, one of the ones I talk about in the book is Samuel Phillips Lee, who was connected. I mean, here's a, he's also a third cousin of Robert E. Lee, but the important connection for him was that he's married to a Blair. So his father-in-law and his brother-in-law, Montgomery and Frank P. Blair, are, are both uh, important individuals that Lincoln has to pay attention to, and he goes to them regularly and says, hey, put in the word for me. I want to be an admiral. Make this happen. Fix it. So Lincoln has those kinds of political problems with admirals. And, and of course, the whole issue, if, if you promote people like David Dixon Porter and John A. Dahlgren, both of whom promoted from commander to rear admiral in one step, you just made a lot of captains very mad. And that's political, but in a different way than political generals were political. I mean, there's still, pol I, I know you will be shocked to hear this, there are still politics in the Army and the Navy today in terms of promotion and, and opportunities and <laughs> command. And you're not shocked to hear that. Okay, well, anyway, so that's, that's how I would respond to that. All right, thank you. All right, I think we're done. Thank you very much. <laughs>